all my training lessons worked out really well. James chapter number four. James chapter number four. I hope you're feeling happy on the inside and uh, joyful about your salvation and Amen. life eternal. Sometimes the outside doesn't really ex express that, does it? When you uh, <laughs> sometimes your face don't show what your heart really feels, and that's because of the difficulties of life. But I'm glad on the inside, no matter what we're going through, there can be a, a rejoicing. Paul said, rejoice in the Lord. And he said again, I say rejoice. Amen. And thank God for eternal life and salvation. James chapter number 4. And we're going to read just one verse in this section. I want to ask you to read with me verse number 8 of James chapter 4. It's an amazing uh, chapter. We're just going to draw your attention to this verse. Verse 8. Draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye you sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Of course, James doesn't begin there or stop there, but I want to just uh, make you mindful this morning that it's your move. It's up to you to respond. It's your move. Let's pray. Father, we love you because you first loved us, and we thank you for the work which you're constantly doing in every individual's life. And it's a work of love and a work of grace that God you would continually draw us and uh, deal with us and help us and warn us and correct us and encourage us. And we thank you, Father, for the work and ministry uh, that the Holy Spirit is uh, accomplishing. We thank you for his abiding presence. Thank you for the, the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. And we pray, God, today that the Holy Ghost of God would just speak to every single heart, convince men of, of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Lord, we pray that you would help us to come to the same conclusions that you've already come to. Lord, help us to think your thoughts. Help us to see what you see. Lord, help us to be concerned about the things that are on your heart and on your mind. And Lord, help us. Help us that we might glorify you. Lord, that in everything we do, that we might think of, or letting the world know how wonderful and amazing Jesus Christ is by the way that we live. And we pray, Father, that you would especially speak to hearts this morning, this service. And God, that you would draw us to yourself. And Lord, in the invitation, I pray that we might have a personal response to what you would say to us today, that we would respond to you and do exactly what you'd have us to do. And Father, help us. We realize that we can't accomplish anything this morning without the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, without you, it's, it's nothing can be done or accomplished. And we, we pray for your presence and your power and your work in this service that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, we pray and ask these things. Amen. In relationship, sometimes the questions come up as to who should be the next person to respond. I mean, you've been in that situation before. Uh, you're wondering, who should make the next move or the next call or the next text? And there's so many different things you can do to respond to relationships today. It's amazing. But relationships aren't like chess or checkers. My, my sons are more intelligent than I am. They play chess. I play, still play checkers. But in, in those games, you have a turn, and then your opponent has a turn, and then you have another turn. Well, relationships are far more complex than that. It's not, well, they do something, and then you do something, and they do something, and then you do something. And a lot of times you're wondering exactly, how am I to deal with this situation? How am I to respond next? Especially if you want that relationship to be closer or more intimate or you want it to, uh, to really develop and to be a strong relationship, you might wonder often, well, what should be the next move that I make on this? Sometimes around the house we'll be talking about subjects like this. Well, uh, 
Maybe you shouldn't be the one that responds next. Give them an opportunity to respond. And I want to try to encourage you this morning that when it comes to God, it's up to you now to make the next move because God has done some amazing things. All that He has done has brought you to this point. So now it's up to you to draw nigh unto God. It's your move. If your relationship with God is going to improve, if it's going to grow, then you've got to be the one that responds to Him. And by the way, you see this dynamic all throughout the Bible when it comes to relationships and, and how are you going to respond to this individual or that situation. One of those is found in 2 Samuel chapter 14, verses 28-33. through 33. Absalom has been away from the kingdom for two years and now he's come back and he's feeling, though, isolated. He's not allowed to go and talk with his father, King David, and he's wondering, well, I'm here now for two years and, I mean, why am I even living back here if I can't have any relationship with my father? So he sends for Joab. He wants Joab to go and intercede for him. I mean, you remember this story. And uh, so he sends his servant down to Joab, and Joab doesn't respond at all. He doesn't say, well, I'll come tomorrow or next week. He hears nothing back from Joab whatsoever. So he sends another servant to Joab, saying, listen, now I want you to come. I've got a, an issue that I need you to help me with. And Joab doesn't respond again. And so Absalom looks at his servants and said, you go down to Joab's barley fields that are next to mine and you burn his barley fields. And when Joab looked on his fields burning, he ran to Absalom's home and said, what do you think you're doing? And Absalom said, I've been trying to get your attention. That's what I'm doing. Amaze Jackson, an old-time independent Baptist preacher, used to preach a message along these lines, God shall, will burn your barley fields. And you know what? Sometimes God has to move on us in like manner. He's speaking to us. He sends servants to us. And we, he gets no response whatsoever. So he touches something that's precious to us. And then we find ourselves on our face saying, God, what do you want from me? You might also remember reading the Psalm Song of Solomon, chapter number 5. Uh, <clears throat> the beloved comes to the door and he places his hand on the door handle and he calls out to his love that's inside and he wants to be able to come in and spend time with his love. And she hears his voice and she hesitates. Let me remember reading this in Song of Solomon, chapter number 5. She said, well, I've I'm in bed, I've washed my feet, I've taken a bath. I, and so, and it's just a brief hesitation. And then she finally comes to herself and she, and she runs to the door. But if you want to look at it later on, look at verse number 6. She opens the door and the Bible says, and he has gone away. And she runs in the streets and she's trying to find her beloved, but now he was right there at the door. If she hadn't hesitated, she could have welcomed him in. They could have had a wonderful time of fellowship, but she hesitated, and now she's running hither and there, and she can't find him anywhere. Her beloved has gone away. And let me warn you also about when God is dealing with you, you may think, well, I have forever to respond to his calls of love. And don't, don't ever doubt this. When he's calling out to you, he's calling out to you, as, and those are calls of love. And you think, well, I'll just respond to him anytime I want to. You may find yourself just like this lady did, going to the door only to find now that he has gone away. Well, Luke chapter 15 tells us of another example. Here is a young boy that's <laughs> tired of living underneath his daddy's roof. And how many parents would say, I don't know sometimes whether to push or pull? How many parents are here would say amen to that? Raise your hand or say, ah, you know, I, sometimes I don't know what to do. 
I don't know whether to say something or not say something. And the youngest boy comes to his daddy and he says, I want what is mine. Now you know this conversation isn't starting out very well All right, already. Give me what belongs to me. Well, first of all, nothing belongs to you. <laughs> it still all belongs to your father. You don't have a thing, right? But the father don't argue with him. He doesn't try to say, son, you're going to make a bit. We don't have any of that part of the conversation. He gives his son what he asked for. And let me just insert here some of the worst times in your life is when God allows you to get what you say you want. And he takes that money and he goes out and he finally, quote unquote, enjoys life. This is what he thought the big city was like. And he's really going to have a fit and a time and he's going to enjoy everything that he can enjoy. And as long as the money's flowing, the beer's flowing, the women are coming and going, and he is just having himself some kind of a party and then he reaches for his wallet and he realizes he is empty and the funds are gone and when the funds are gone, the friends go too. Amen? He finds himself in the hog pen desiring because he's so hungry to eat the slop that the hogs are eating. That's how far down sin will take you. Amen? Until he finally comes to himself. Remember the story? And he goes back to his father and he finds that his father has been going to the edge of the road looking down, I think, looking down in the morning, in the, in the, at noon, at lunchtime. He's looking down the road all throughout the day desiring his son to return home. But notice what the father never did. He never went after the son. He didn't leave the house. He didn't go looking for the son. You know why? Because that father understood something. Until that son comes to that life-changing decision himself, there's really little that I can do about it. And if I go down there and drag him back to the house, guess what? I'm probably going to have to go through this over and over and over again and so the father never seeks after the son until the son finally changes his mind and heart towards the father. And then there's a real relationship like there ought to be, but that's never going to happen until the son changes his mind and his heart. I imagine the father said often, should I go? Maybe I'm, I'm the one that should make the first move. Maybe that's all my son is waiting for, is for me to make the first move. Move, but that wasn't the wise move. And I thank God for the example of this godly father in Luke chapter number 15. Well, we have another little example. It's in the book of Matthew. Matthew tells us about if we have offended a brother or sister in Christ. In Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said if you come to the altar and you want to give God a gift, and there you remember that you have ought against your brother. He said, it's your responsibility to go to your brother and settle that difference first and then come back and offer to God the gift that you want to give him. God said, really, I'm unwilling to receive anything from your hand as long as there's ought between you and, or something between you and a fellow Christian. Well, later on in Matthew chapter 18, he says the church is to deal with people that sin. If someone has sinned against you, then you're to go to them and say, hey, you've wronged me and you need to get this thing right. And my father-in-law said this years ago. He said, when it comes to unity in the church, it's always your, you always have to be first. If you've done somebody wrong, you have to go. If they've wronged you, you still have to go. You have to be the one who's willing to make things right, and when it comes to the unity in the body, you always have to be the one that's going to be the first. Amen? And you know what? If Christians would follow that simple rule, we'd save ourselves a lot of heartache in the church. Amen? If you know somebody's got a problem with you, go to them and say, listen, and, 
And if you don't ever go, you don't ever get the, give them the opportunity to say, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean that. And, and a lot of times just a simple conversation would solve a whole lot of heartache. Amen? So over and over again we have these kind of, what should I do? Who should go first? How should I respond to this situation? And here in James, James says, if you'll draw near to God, then God will draw near to you. And if you'll go back and look at this, James is trying to get these Christians to really get their heart right and to get in a right relationship with God, to get in tune with God, to get back in line with how they should live their Christian life. And this is a part of, of getting back into a, 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 a unity with God like God wants for every one of us to walk in that deep unity with Him, we have to realize that God is working and He is speaking and it's up to us to respond to what God is doing in our life. Let me point out one thing, first of all, to you concerning this. It's, the, it's, it's not that God is being selfish like some of us have been selfish before. Have you ever gotten an argument and you thought, well, as soon as they admit that they're wrong, then I'll... How many would uh, 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 show your hand on that? <laughs> that's, probably, that's my fault over and over again. If Brenda will ever just admit that she has just done terribly wrong, then I'll be so gracious and kind and I'll forgive her just like that. But she better come to that place where she admits that she's wrong. And I can see by y'all's displeasure that y'all never had to do that. <laughs> but you know, God is not that way. He's not just being petty here. He's not just being, well... You know, you, not, you need to make some steps and then I'll, I'll think about making some steps myself because I want you to think about this. His love is really an unrequited love. That He is, he is loved and loved and loved and loved and loved and, and gone far beyond anything that you and I could imagine that, that someone would go and yet our response has often been no response at all to the, all the amazing things that God has done toward us. Remember in 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 19 when he teaches us there that we love him. And why is it that we love him? Because he first loved us. And God has always been first when it comes to your relationship with him. He's always been the one that comes to you first. And if you stop and just think about that in a moment, you'd have to say a hearty amen to that. Amen? Because when you were lost in your sin and you were dead in your nature to God, God is the first one that came and knocked on the door of your dead spirit and said, listen to me, I love you and I died for you and God dealt with you and you were lost and undone and in your sin God's always the one that comes first it's illustrated in Genesis chapter number 3 when Eve and Adam sinned as they ate of the forbidden tree of the knowledge of good and evil and then they discovered self-awareness they discovered what the problem with sin was going to be for all their descendants that we were going to be more concerned about us and we would not be concerned about what God wanted, and they realized that they were unclothed, and they sewed fig leaves together, and God came in the cool of the day calling out to Adam and Eve, and what did they do? They ran and hid themselves from the presence of God. And that's what man's been doing ever since Adam and Eve sinned. They have been running from the presence of God. Why is it hard to get people to come to church? Well, it's not because we need to change our music. It's not because, you know, that they're too busy and too many things are going on in the world. It's hard to get people to come to church because when you come to church, God is evident and, and His Spirit is working. And so many people who come to church say, I feel so uncomfortable in church. Well, it's because the presence of a holy God is in the place and people don't like the presence of a holy God and so they 
withdraw themselves from God's holy presence. He is always first when it comes to our relationship with Him. It's an unrequited love. Brother Gray mentioned this in his prayer right before the church services, Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. But God commendeth His love toward us, that is, God demonstrated it. You say, how do I know that God loves me? Me, because He went to the cross and died for you. God demonstrated His love. He, he stretched out His arms on Calvary's hill and said, I love you this much. That's how much God loves you. And He proved His love for you. Amen? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That's how much God loves you and wants to rescue you from your sinful condition lest you perish and spend eternity in hell as He gave His Son on the cross so that you can have forgiveness of your sins and eternal life. Amen? But God commended His love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, God didn't get interested in you when you started cleaning up yourself and you, you quit doing this and you quit doing that and He said, okay, now I've got these sins dealt with and, and now I've stopped doing that and I'm going to work on my cussing and, and when I get that right and then, then I'll come to God and I'll, and I'll do business with God. And God said, no, I loved you when you were at your worst. Well, you were, in a, you were a sinner. Christ died for you. I remember uh, a man by the name of E.J. E.J. was saved here at our church at the age of 67. His wife, Fassie, started attending church and, and E.J. wouldn't come to church with her. And so I went over to his house and visited with him for a little while. I said, Mr. E.J., tell me about your, your spiritual condition. He said, well, I'm working on some things. I've quit this and I've quit that and, and I've quit that and, and I'm, I'm really working on some stuff. I said, Mr. E.J., you're getting a cart before the horse. You're getting this thing all backwards. It's not save yourself and then come to Jesus. <laughs> it's Jesus saves us and then he, He's the one that frees us from the power and penalty of sin. You don't clean your life up and then get acceptable in God's sight. God loves even the sinner. There's a man in the Bible who looked his life and said, I'm the worst sinner that's ever walked on the face of the earth. And that man's name before he was saved was Saul. And Saul was a very religious man and he looked at Christianity as though it was a cult and he determined that for God he was going to destroy this cult called Christianity. And so he had Christians killed, he destroyed homes, he took people's possessions and, and he did everything he could to make sure Christianity would not flourish. And one day he was going to Damascus to kill more Christians and prison more Christians. And on the road to Damascus he saw a great light and he heard the voice of Jesus. And, and on that road he got saved and God changed his life. And he said, listen, if God would save a sinner like me, the worst sinner in the world, God would certainly save any other sinner in the world. That's his point, amen? Amen. And God loves you even in your sin. Now listen, what salvation does, it delivers you from sin, but you can't save yourself and then expect Jesus to save. You come as you are and Jesus is the one that takes away the power of sin in your life. He loved you first. That section, Romans 5.8, it says, a few might die for a righteous man, some would even die for a good man. But God died for us when we were dirty, rotten sinners. Go and look at it in the Greek. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loves you first. And it's an unrequited love. When he, when he was on the cross, you were on His mind. If you're saved this very day, your sins have been forgiven. It's because of that great love that God had for you when He died on Calvary's hill. And yes, God gave His life on that old rugged hill so that you could be saved. 
And so many people don't even stop and think about the amazing love that He has towards them that He would give such a wonderful gift so that they could have eternal life and forgiveness of their sins. It's an unrequited love. He's not saying, I've done nothing. You make the first step. He's saying something like we find in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 5. What more could I have done than that that I have done? I mean, what else can God do to prove how much that He cares for you and to get so little response to that care and love and compassion? It should break our heart that we treat Jesus the way that we treat Jesus. Amen? And it's an unreasonable response. It's not only just an unrequited love, it's an unreasonable response to this amazing thing that God has done for every single one of us not to seek Him first not to make Him the priority of our life not to fall down before Him continuously in worship and adoration it's unreasonable to respond to God the way that we respond to Him let me go say amen to that to think that He should do more than what He has done you remember the Pharisees and the scribes? Remember they came to Jesus on one occasion in Matthew chapter number 12, verses 38 and 39. They came to Jesus and said, Jesus, show us a sign. Show us that you are the Christ, the Messiah. Do some strange work. Show us some kind of miracle. Jesus, do something amazing. And if you do something amazing or miraculous, We'll say that you are Messiah, that you're the Christ. Now listen to me. That, that might sound reasonable, but how much had he already done when they made this foolish request? They know already of many of the mighty works Jesus did, and they're still asking him to do more? Some of these very men were in the room when the tiles were broken off the ceiling and this poor, paralyzed man was let down in the middle of them. And Jesus said, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And they said, Oh, nobody can forgive sin but God. Amen, that's right. <laughs> and God just did forgive that man of his sin because Jesus is not just a good man and he's not just a great teacher. He is God robed in flesh. And they were appalled that Jesus said, Thy sins be forgiven thee. And Jesus said, Well, let me, t let me ask you a question. Which is harder to do? To forgive sin or to heal this man's body? I imagine they were thinking, Well, if you healed this man, that would be something. And Jesus said to that man, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately his entire body received strength. And he took up his bed and walked out of the house. Some of these guys were there. When he opened blinded eyes, listen, eyes that were just not, not just covered in cataracts, eyes that had never seen since this mother's womb, had never seen anything, not the light of day. And they saw Jesus touch men, and those men received their sight. Some of them probably even saw Jesus help the widow Nain, who had lost her only son. And she was a widow. Her husband had died. Now her son had died, and she was going to be in a helpless state. And Jesus knew her broken heart, and he went to where the boy was laying dead, and he said, Rise up. And the life came back to that boy. And these men are saying, Jesus, do something. Show some kind of miracle. And we'll believe. Listen, what I'm trying to get you to see is no matter how many times He shows Himself a loving, gracious, powerful, good God, people are still going to say who are, have evil hearts and adulterous hearts they're still going to ask for more evidence and more evidence and more evidence. And you can't get any weightier evidence than what we have. I mean, say amen to that. It's your turn now. 
They took His dead body from off the cross where He died for your sins and my sins and the sins of the world. And they placed it in a borrowed tomb and early one Sunday morning Jesus walked out of that tomb alive from the dead never to die again. How much more does He have to do? He said to these men, you're not going to see any other sign except the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was in the belly of a well three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. And when I walk out of that tomb, it should settle it once and for all and forever. I'm the Christ, the Messiah, God in flesh. There should be no more questions. And when Jesus walks out of the tomb, which is historically proven, amen, people still say, hey, show me something else. My father-in-law had an uncle that had an unusual experience in salvation. He saw a light. Not like the Apostle Paul, but he saw a light. And, and somehow God used that to convince him of the truth of the Gospel. And he gave his life to Jesus and he was saved. And the relative of he has heard that he had saw a light. And so from then on, he kept seeing, if, saying, if God ever shows me a, that light, a light like that, if I ever see that, then I'll get saved. And he died waiting to see something like his relative saw when he had the full account of the gospel the whole time, ignoring all, it's unreasonable, all that he had already done. The gospel is not see a light and have a fuzzy feeling, and then by faith receive Christ. That's not the gospel. The gospel is believe the record God has given us concerning His Son. Turn from your selfish, sinful ways. Give your life to Christ. Put your faith in Him, and you can have eternal life. In the gospel of Luke, chapter number 23, Pilate was trying to get out from under his responsibility of what what do I have to do with this Jesus? And if I can put him off on somebody else, I, I, I will. I don't want to have to make a decision about this Christ. And so he heard that Jesus had been around Herod's region and reigned, so he sent Jesus to Herod, and Herod was thrilled that Jesus was coming to him. And this is interesting. Herod never went to Jesus. He had heard a lot of great things about Jesus. He says he did. He had heard some mighty miracles that Jesus performed. But guess what? Herod never stepped off his throne and sought Jesus and said, let me talk to you. I need to, I need to understand what e eternal life is and salvation. He never sought Christ, but when Christ came to him, he was excited. And you said, why was he excited? Because he'd heard Jesus had done some amazing things and he was hoping to see Jesus perform some kind of miracle. So Herod asked him a lot of questions. And you know what Jesus did? He didn't say a word. Yeah. Not a single word. Hey, Jesus, do something great. Show us, how, show us your power. Aren't you the one that healed people? Show us what you can do. I didn't come here to put on a show. I'm not here for magic tricks. I don't just do miracles at someone's desire. There's always a, I'll, I do what the Father wants me to do. I don't have to prove myself to Herod. And listen to me, Jesus doesn't have, have to prove himself to you either. He's done more than enough for you to run to his feet and bow before him and say, yes, Jesus, I will respond to you and I will, it is my turn and I will draw nigh to you because I've got a promise that you'll also draw Every step I take, amen, he takes the more. Listen to me. You are as close to God as you want to be. How many would say amen to that? If we have this promise, draw near, nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you, you are as close as you want to be. It's not him that wants a distant relationship. He wants it to be intimate. He wants it to be real. He wants it to be powerful. He wants it to be passionate. But He can't love you that way when you're going to keep Him at arm's length. 
and keep questioning Him and not demonstrating genuine faith and trust in the revealed will of God. It's unreasonable. (laughs) Why would we treat such a wonderful Savior this way? There's no real answer to that question. Amen? I think all of us, when we stand before Him on that day of judgment, when our names are called, we're going to be broken hearted that we didn't do more for Him than what we did do. Amen? But what, what should it be like? If we know that He is going to come closer and closer and closer to us, what should we be doing? We should be unrelenting in our pursuit. Let me say amen to that. That's, that should be, that's the right and appropriate response for every Christian. We should be unrelenting in our pursuit. Oftentimes we'll seek after Christ and then get, listen to me, I know this, I've fallen in this trap a multitude of times and we'll get distracted by the busyness of life. I mean to say, hey, that's been me at times. I mean, God's been dealing my heart and I'm growing in grace and I know I'm, boy, I've am i got my eyes on Jesus and things are wonderful and then all of a sudden I've something in the world grabbed my attention and, and it's been months or longer since I've really been before my Lord like I need to be before my Lord. And you say, what's caused that? Well, just the busyness of life. A young man came to town, (laughs) asked for our assistance at church, and so we went and helped him, and he comes from another church, and he said, well, I'll be at church next Sunday. And and I called him and said, hey, you're going to be able to make it? He said, no, I've got to... I've got to buy the equipment and, and, and look at it. The owner's here, and, but, but next Sunday. And so I sent a message yesterday. I said, hey, I'd love to come by and pick you up for church. And he said, well, I'm sorry. I have to go to St. Augustine. We've got a convention down there. And, I, and so I sent him back and I said, be careful about getting entangled in the things of this world. Matthew 6, 33. But seek you first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. See, on our part, it should be an unrelenting pursuit. This is the most, Jesus is the most important one, the most precious one. Above anything else in this world, He is our Maker and our Creator. He gave His life on Calvary's hill. He he deserves our, our fullest attention. He deserves the first place in our life. He deserves our best effort. Where do you give your best? What do you give your best effort to? You know, if we had to be honest, sometimes we'd say, well, I give my best effort to pleasure, or I give my best effort to my employment, or I give my best energy and effort to, and there's so many other things that we put there, but Jesus should be the one that is there. I give my best effort to Him. Jeremiah 29, 13 says this, And you shall seek me and find me. You say, boy, I'd love to know God better. I'd like to really have a relationship with Him like the Bible describes intimate fellowship. I would just love that as a Christian. I, I want that more than anything in the world. And then God gives this promise, not just here, but, but in Deuteronomy also. You shall seek me and find me. But this is the condition. When you shall search for me with all of your heart. See, if you just say, I'll get, I'll get to Jesus when I, you know, when I have time, or when I think about it, or when I settle down, or when I, after this, after that, Jesus said, listen, that's the kind of relationship you want to have. Help yourself to it. And you're missing out on so many blessings because you're using the poorest substitutes in this world for the most precious relationship that you could ever have and that's the relationship with your Creator. Amen? If you're here this morning and you're unsaved, you're lost. If you died today, you would spend eternity in hell. It's your move. 
Christ extends the arms of invitation and hear His words. It's not my words, it's His words. Come unto Me. And if you would come to Jesus, you could have forgiveness and eternal life. But if you're saved, quit wasting the precious time that you have. And it is precious. And we forget it's precious. Vicky told us about an 18-year-old at Southeastern that had cancer and, and we prayed and, and, and that they prayed and the cancer was gone and we were so overjoyed and, and then we think, all of us, well, he should have a long, healthy life and then cancer comes back. And they tell this 19-year-old, you only have a few, few weeks. There's a man in my father-in-law's church, and there's, it's, it's a small church already, and he's one of the biggest helps there, Mr. Robert. And <laughs> he's had trouble breathing, went to the doctor, and they said, listen, you've got cancer, and you don't have but maybe a month or two to live. Do you think he thought that's what he was going to hear when he went to the doctor? It's the last thing in the world he thought he'd hear. Quit wasting the precious time. You have earnestly seek God. Remember Hebrews eleven six. But without faith it's impossible to please Him, for he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. If you diligently seek Me, God said, I'll make sure that you're rewarded for it. You say, I believe God is. That's wonderful. But are you diligently seeking after Him? God said, if you do that, if you diligently seek after Him, and listen, you say, what should I go on? You should go on faith. That's what He promised. That if I diligently seek after Him, He is going to be rewarding that. He's not going to let that effort go unrewarded. He will not. <laughs> I mean, have there been a church service where God just showed up? And I mean, it was just powerful. You knew God's here. How I many have there ever been a service like that? Now, sadly, they're few and far between, right? How many have been in your prayer time when God showed up in the prayer room? And you knew, listen, this is not some fuzzy feeling. This is God. And God has condescended and He's met with me in this time of prayer. And there's nothing like that, is it? Nothing like that in all the world. And we're substituting some silly things for the genuine presence of a holy God. Quit wasting precious time. Earnestly seek Him. If you're saved and seeking Him, then seek Him with all your heart. See, James said, Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And purify your heart, ye double-minded. When you go to work, sometimes we, 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 we set, try to separate out Christianity and work. No. Carry into that workplace. Pray about every decision and every conversation and everything that you do. Lord, I, just, I want you involved. I want you involved in the, this phone conversation that I have. I want you to involve when I walk into the building. I want you in, Involved when I meet this stranger. Lord, I don't want you just to be at church on Sunday. I want to live for you constantly. And listen to me, God will bless that. But don't be double-minded or double-hearted about that. Seek Him with all of your heart. And see what God will do. Amen? If you're lost, come to Christ. If you're not seeking Him, repent of that. Cleanse your hands. Get right with God. If you're seeking Him, but you know I'm not giving it the effort I should, then you should come and say, God, I want to give you everything I have so that I can live a life that's pleasing to you. Would you do that? Let's stand for a word of prayer. If God's dealt with your heart, would you come, respond to Him this morning, and let Jesus have His way in your life. Father, we ask You that You would help us. This has been... A an unusual service, but Lord, we know that you're at work. And we pray for the unsaved. 
God, if You would touch their heart, if You would draw them this morning and help them, they could be saved in this very service. And we ask You, Father, You would do that. Lord, You would help them. Take them by the hand. Bring them to Christ so they could be saved today. And Father, for the believers that are here, they realize that really their only (laughs) times of spiritual thought is when they come into the house of God. And outside of that, they don't pick up their Bible. They don't spend any time in prayer. Or there has to be more to Christianity than that. And they have to know that. That is not what you, you want. And if it's all that they want, something is wrong with the heart. God help them to realize it's their opportunity to draw nigh, to take the steps. It's their move. And help them, Father, to move today. And for those Christians that are seeking you, oh, they want to seek you with all their heart, help them to come and say, Lord, help me. Help me to give all of my attention and devotion to you. If it means foregoing the pleasures in this world for the presence of God, Lord, we would be unwise to hold on to the pleasures of this world. God, help us in this invitation. Change our hearts and change our lives. Do a great work, a gracious work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you come as we sing page 255?